Okay. Intro. Uh, hello everyone, this is Dr. Abdul Aziz, interventional cardiologist from BSH Apollo Heart Center. And uh, we will be beginning this meeting in a couple of minutes. Before I start uh, the meeting, uh, I would like to tell you that if you have any questions, uh, please uh, text them to us. There's a Q&A uh, box option open, so where you can uh, text the questions to us and we will uh, take up those questions. And uh, if you uh, want to raise a question, please raise your hand and then we will try and uh, unmute you so that you can speak from there. Hello everyone. Good evening to those in Bahrain. Good morning to those in the US. I am Dr. Abdul Aziz, interventional cardiologist at Bahrain Specialist Hospital. We welcome you to this uh, fascinating meeting on COVID-19 and heart disease. Uh, joining us uh, live from Chicago is Dr. Amir Ardati from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Amir is a member of the BSH Apollo Heart Center uh, advisory board and he's a consultant interventional cardiologist practicing in the University of Illinois uh, in Chicago. And uh, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, he has been leading the team overseeing emergency cardiac care preparations and devising guidelines regarding this. He also has co-authored an article uh, which was published recently in Circulation Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes, wherein uh, uh, he has uh, de uh, described the impact of the COVID-19 epidemic on uh, cardiac care. So over to Dr. Amir. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good morning from Chicago. Good evening in Bahrain. And uh, thank you for the kind invitation uh, to participate in uh, BSH's uh, webinar on uh, COVID-19 and heart disease. I appreciate the uh, uh, accompaniment of Dr. Abdulaziz Mohammed, who is our interventional cardiologist uh, 
at uh, Bahrain Specialist Hospital and has been leading our efforts uh, in Bahrain uh, to uh, maintain and expand cardiovascular services uh, during uh, this unprecedented uh, crisis. So thank you uh, for the invitation and uh, thank you for your partnership, doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Amer. Uh, so I would like to uh, uh, tell the uh, rules again, if you must say so. So all of you have been uh, muted and you would be able to listen to both of us. If you have any questions, please raise a hand or put your questions in the Q&A box, box and, and we will take up and answer each of those. All right, and with that, I'll get started uh, with our uh, presentation. The uh, agenda for today is to review uh, uh, how the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic has uh, interacted with heart disease. Uh, we'll review a little bit of the management of COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19 on cardiovascular care. And uh, between these uh, topics, I'd like to share with you some of the cases that we've experienced here in Chicago uh, from the front lines. Um, I, I really do want to emphasize, though, that this does not happen. The response to this crisis does not happen without teamwork, uh, without all of our partners uh, uh, across uh, the medical field and in the community. So I, I thank you all for your uh, dedication, uh, hard work, and sacrifice. So this is the first case. So this was on the first weekend of when cases spiked here in Chicago. Uh, I was called in to see a 32-year-old woman with fever, cough, shortness of breath. Um, at the time, her heart rate was 120. Uh, her temperature was uh, 39.2. Uh, her blood pressure was uh, normal, uh, but she was remarkably obese uh, with a BMI of 80. Um, the emergency department had obtained a CT uh, of the chest that showed a large pericardial effusion. And um, uh, this is a very low quality bedside echocardiogram, but to be frank, we really never got any images better than that given her uh, body habitus. Um, given her tachycardia and our inability to determine the hemodynamic uh, impact of this effusion based on the poor images, uh, we did decide to take her to the lab and do a pericardial drain. Um, so this is just a little picture of us proving that our needle is in the pericardial space. Um, we wore complete PPE, including uh, face masks, hair covering, and an N95 respirator. And we drained a liter of bloody fluid from uh, this woman's pericardium. Um, she was admitted to the intensive care unit. Uh, she had supportive care and managed to be discharged on uh, post-procedure uh, day four and had uh, a good recovery. This case to me highlighted um, that you know the the impact of uh, the coronavirus on on and the intersection of coronavirus on cardiovascular disease. So here you had a young, healthy woman um, with a viral infection uh, presenting with a serious uh, cardiac uh, complication related to disease that may well could have been uh, fatal had she not had it uh, taken care of. Um, we now have several months of experience uh, with this disease. And uh, as many of you know, this is review for what COVID-19 uh, behaves like um, in the community. Uh, initial clinical symptoms tend to be mild uh, with fever, dry cough, possibly diarrhea and headache. On uh, clinical uh, evaluation, the patients may have uh, lymphopenia um, uh, or uh, mild uh, coagulopathy. As time progresses and the viral phase of this disorder winds down, the host inflammatory response can be quite dramatic. And this is what we think results in the major morbidity related to this disease with uh, a pattern of lung injury consistent with acute, res uh, acute um, uh, ARDS and, uh, and progressive uh, inflammatory response resulting in vasodilation, severe coagulopathy, and end organ uh, damage, including uh, acute renal injury requiring dialysis, uh, myocardial injury, um, and uh, ultimately uh, uh, mortality. Um, the therapies uh, for this condition are less clear. Um, uh, many of you have read in the popular media the use of hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and remdesivir um, for this disorder, but the Clinical science behind this uh, remains poor and weak, and it's unclear whether any of these therapies uh, actually uh, impact the disease disorder. That being said, there are several interventions that are uh, uh, helpful, and we'll review those uh, briefly. 
So why uh, and how does myocardial injury and the COVID-19 virus intersect? Well, um, the uh, scientists in China have done a great job of giving us a lot of uh, data on how this happens. And in Wuhan, anywhere from 20 to 27% of patients with COVID-19 were found to have myocardial injury uh, defined as a, high, as a troponin uh, being positive. Um, not only was this a common finding, this common finding was associated with markedly worse uh, outcomes, including the need for mechanical ventilation and renal replacement therapy and ultimately death. We know that not only is myocardial injury common, we know that the combination of a prior history of, myocard of heart disease, be it hypertension, heart failure, or coronary artery disease, and the presence of acute heart injury is associated with worse outcomes with uh, patients who have a known history of cardiovascular disease and an elevated troponin have an extraordinarily high mortality of 70% in those patients that are admitted to the hospital. And this sends a signal to us that we really need to pay attention to those patients with risk factors for heart disease and uh, that they need to be one, protected from contracting this infection at all costs. And when admitted uh, to the hospital, should they uh, develop this disease, they need to be treated um, with extraordinary uh, caution and care uh, to help prevent progression of disease. So why does uh, myocardial injury occur? Well, it appears to be multifactorial, but one of the very interesting things about this disease process is the propensity um, of the body to develop a coagulopathy with increased thrombotic events. In uh, this, one of the first autopsy studies of patients with COVID-19, the uh, pathologists at, uh, in uh, New Orleans found diffuse microthrombi throughout the lung and uh, scattered macrothrombi uh, throughout the lung tissue uh, with subsequent impairment of right ventricular function and failure of the right ventricle. In fact, in uh, studies of, uh, uh, of cohorts in uh, China and in Europe, the risk of uh, venous thromboembolic phenomenon appears to be as high as 25%. And this raises the question of what is the optimal uh, VTE prophylaxis in these patients and do we need to move beyond prophylactic doses of uh, anticoagulants to therapeutic doses. And again, this remains an unanswered question. Uh, I can tell you in anecdotal practice here that the incidence of, uh, of large vessel thrombosis, be it in the arms or the legs, is extraordinarily high in the patients that we're managing in the, uh, in the intensive care unit. And in fact, many patients who have been clinically stable with stable ventilator settings uh, uh, suddenly decompensate with hypotension and severe hypoxemia, suggesting an acute uh, pulmonary embolic event that is uh, uniformly uh, fatal. We do know that myocardial injury in this condition is likely multifactorial. Um, we, uh, we suspect multiple um, uh, inputs here, including uh, the cytokine storm uh, disorder, that's the post-inflammatory response, um, we've seen uh, arrhythmic disorders causing increased myocardial demand. We've seen the frank impact of uh, diffuse tissue hypoxia causing myocardial injury. And then, uh, you know, run-of-the-mill uh, microvascular uh, injury and thrombosis all appear to contribute to the finding of abnormal troponin. In uh, a fascinating study uh, from uh, Italy where they managed to do cardiac MRI on uh, patients with uh, myocarditis or the finding of acute LV systolic dysfunction, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the MRI images showed diffuse myocardial edema and the late gadolinium enhancement images show evidence of uh, myocardial scarring consistent with uh, a myocarditis pattern. Now, interestingly, in other um, uh, endomyocardial biopsy studies and uh, pathology studies, the uh, injury to the myocardium uh, uh, appears to be secondary to inflammatory, uh, uh, infection of inflammatory cells and not due uh, to direct uh, uh, viral invasion of the myocardium, um, which may have a role in, uh, in uh, dictating what therapies we offer in the future. The um, extent of acute COVID-19 cardiovascular symptoms is broad. So we have seen everything in our healthcare system from acute frank coronary syndrome, so true plaque rupture and thrombosis, to acute myocardial injury without any evidence of coronary disease, 
um, uh, acute arrhythmias, including torsades and ventricular tachycardia, which may be related uh, both to the disease process itself or the use of QT prolonging medications. Uh, heart failure and cardiogenic shock um, uh, have been observed, and it's often difficult to differentiate cardiogenic shock from distributive shock in these patients who have uh, multiple uh, concomitant clinical uh, conditions. As I showed you earlier, a case of a pericardial effusion with tamponade, and then the thromboembolic complications appear to be um, a, a very common uh, disorder here uh, that uh, may be an opportunity for intervention. So uh, within a week of the case that I showed you of the uh, pericardial effusion, my partner took this patient to a lab. So this is a 61-year-old man with shortness of breath, chest pain, and a chest x-ray showing diffuse infiltrates. Uh, his electrocardiogram on presentation showed uh, sinus tachycardia with uh, ST elevations in the uh, precordial leads. And uh, what was interesting about the morphology of these ST elevations, they were suggestive of Brugada. Uh, now, in this patient, we didn't have a baseline uh, electrocardiogram. Uh, we did do a bedside echo, and we found that he had uh, diffuse severe LV systolic dysfunction. So the decision was made to take the patient to the lab for an urgent angiogram again, after dressing in complete uh, PPE. And in this case, uh, the patient's angiogram was completely normal. Um, and the patient was transferred to the ICU, um, uh, where he subsequently developed a narrow complex uh, tachycardia. And after supportive care for his uh, diagnosed COVID-19 infection and defervescence, his uh, EKG improved, his ST segments uh, disappeared, um, and he was discharged uh, within a week without requiring uh, mechanical ventilation. So how common is arrhythmia in COVID-19? Well, it appears to be ubiquitous with nearly 20% of patients admitted uh, being found to have some evidence of arrhythmia. And it appears to be uh, correlated to the severity of disease with almost half of ICU admissions having an arrhythmia and VTVF occurring in 6% of patients. Um, we think that um, this drive towards arrhythmia, again, is multifactorial, and it may be driven by direct um, uh, viral uh, induced myocardial injury uh, or uh, by medication uh, induced prolongation of the QT interval. Um, as again, we mentioned earlier, the use of antimalarials uh, has become very popular for the management of COVID-19. And it's well known that these drugs uh, impact the QT interval. It is strongly recommended that they be re uh, avoided in patients with a QT, uh, corrected QT greater than 500 milliseconds, and that patients treated with these drugs um, have their QT interval measured closely and have the drugs withdrawn if they uh, develop a QT interval greater than 500. In addition uh, to measuring and managing the QT interval, it is critical uh, to have judicious uh, management of electrolytes in these patients to keep the potassium above four and the magnesium above two, and to avoid the use of other concomitant QT prolonging drugs uh, like fluoroquinolones or antipsychotics. Uh, so remember, uh, these drugs that we're using to treat COVID-19 are frankly exploratory, and uh, many of them are known to be QT prolonging drugs. Uh, so both chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are known precipitants of lo lo long QT syndrome and have been associated with ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, as has azithromycin and lopinavir and ritonavir. Um, again, it's really important to understand that the safety and efficacy of this combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin has not been demonstrated and is currently the subject of over 130 studies um, in the clinicaltrials.gov uh, repository of uh, prospective clinical trials. So what do we know about hydroxychloroquine? Um, we, we don't know much, uh, to be frank. The uh, popular study that's, uh, that's been quoted in the media from France was a non-randomized open label trial um, that suggested efficacy in reducing viral load. Um, this study had a lot of methodological uh, concerns, including uh, the fact that the comparator group uh, uh, were, were patients who declined to be involved in the trial and were frankly non-randomized. Um, in fact, the publisher of the trial disavowed the, the trial uh, outright. Um, and at the current moment in the United States, at least, uh, the combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin is not recommended uh, for the routine care of COVID-19.
Uh, what about remdesivir? Uh, uh, again, this has been very popular in the media, um, and uh, remdesivir, for those of you, uh, uh, is a drug that was uh, developed by uh, the manufacturer Gilead in response to the Ebola crisis. Uh, similar to Ebola, uh, COVID-19 is an RNA uh, virus, and uh, this uh, drug uh, works to uh, cease uh, RNA-based uh, replication and uh, tissue invasion. Um, uh, in a non-randomized single-arm study, it showed that uh, a little bit over two-thirds of patients treated uh, with this drug under compassionate use improved. Um, and in a recent leaked report uh, from the University of Chicago, um, it seemed that this drug was effective. Uh, just remember, none of this is randomized data and trials are ongoing and will be reported in May. Uh, here is what is going on, and this is actually a very abbreviated list of all the clinical trials uh, for the management of COVID-19. Um, I think the message here is to stay tuned. Um, the candidate drugs need to be safe and effective, and there are no shortcuts. Uh, we need well-designed, randomized clinical trials um, uh, uh, to guide uh, treatment of this disease that is highly prevalent and uh, potentially highly morbid. So what does work uh, for the management of COVID-19? Um, and uh, for me, it's a source of great pride to know uh, that Bahrain has done so well uh, with their public health interventions and management of this disorder. If you look at confirmed COVID-19 deaths normalized uh, by population, uh, Bahrain has done as well as South Korea. Um, for those of you that know, South Korea diagnosed their first case of COVID-19 on the same day that United States did. However, their public health intervention was much better uh, managed and robust, and that uh, resulted in a much better control of morbidity related to this disease. Um, in Europe, uh, they ran a similar uh, policy study where Scandinavian countries almost uniformly shut down uh, their economies and instituted social distancing except for Sweden. And you can see that the result of that is much higher death rate in Sweden than in their neighbors in uh, Finland, uh, Denmark, and uh, Norway. So the message here is that prevention works. Um, Community-based uh, social distancing, hand hygiene, and continued closure of non-essential activities is an effective public health measure that reduces mortality. Uh, hospitals and healthcare centers continue the need to reduce non-urgent encounters and to use uh, personal protective equipment carefully. Um, we know that established public health measures like testing and contact tracing works and that once the patient reaches the hospital confines, high quality critical care um, is effective. So ARDS best practices, and uh, I can't say this enough, uh, nursing, nursing, nursing may well be more important uh, than uh, what uh, physicians uh, actually do in this case. So how about actual coronary disease? Well, here is another patient that I had the chance to take care of, uh, a 68-year-old uh, man presented to our hospital after having chest pain uh, for several hours. And here you can see that he has diffuse ST uh, uh, segment elevations uh, throughout his electrocardiogram. He was in a lot of pain. On history, he denied uh, fever or cough, and he was frankly afebrile when he arrived. And we took him uh, directly to the cath lab. Uh, and again, uh, here you see the real deal, a, a mid-LAD thrombotic occlusion. Um, you can see following angioplasty, a very heavy clot burden with clot um, extending into the first septal perforator and occluding the apical LED. And here, uh, post stent uh, with a good proximal result, uh, maintenance of the first septal perforator, but residual clot in the apical LED that was treated with um, a little bit of uh, doddering angioplasty and a 2B3A. Um, and here, uh, if the video doesn't come across, uh, proximal LED occlusion, high clot burden, and uh, restoration of TIMI3 flow in the vessel. Uh, this patient went home on post-operative day three, uh, doing well, on, and he was subsequently tested to be COVID negative. Why is this case exciting? Well, I'll tell you, it's the first STEMI I took care of in the last month. Um, in a busy city like Chicago, it's been very quiet on the STEMI front, and this uh, phenomenon um, of where did all the heart attacks go has been observed not only here in the United States where we've seen 
uh, an over 30% reduction in the uh, in the in STEMI care since the initiation of the COVID era, uh, but was also described in Hong Kong early in the COVID uh, experience, again in Bergamo in Italy, and subsequently in Madrid. Um, in these other places, we've seen that STEMIs are presenting late, um, and that when they do finally present, that established STEMI systems of care are overwhelmed and are taking care of these patients in a slower fashion. And uh, moreover, patients are more likely to be treated with uh, second-class thrombolytic therapy uh, in places where they would have usually received primary PCI. So why is this happening? Where are the delays occurring in the management of acute heart attacks in established STEMI systems? Well, um, so looking at this very busy graphic, we'll go down through it line by line. Um, patients are afraid. Uh, patients are concerned uh, that they will contract an infection in the hospital and they don't want to be exposed to other people. Um, uh, clinicians are worried. You know, when they take a phone call from a patient, they may want to minimize what's going on to avoid having more patients come in. Um, we know that uh, emergency medical services and transport times have increased significantly um, and uh, that it takes time for the ambulances to arrive uh, to places and to them to uh, transport patients to hospitals. Um, many uh, hospitals that deliver uh, care for acute uh, cardiac conditions are uh, large hub hospitals that are already overwhelmed with the management of COVID-19 patients. Um, so their throughput may be reduced due to reduced staffing or reduced equipment. Um, and then finally, once the patient arrives in the lab, the requirement um, and the frank need to use uh, adequate PPE and for uh, room management uh, may be a burden. So it appears that all of these things are really uh, conspiring to impact the quality of care for ST elevations um, uh, around the world. So uh, this recommendation that was released by the Society of uh, Coronary Angiography and Intervention uh, just a couple of days ago um, really uh, helps emphasize the critical need to recognize that MI occurs in the COVID era, that it can happen to patients with or without COVID-19, and that um, care should eventually uh, reach the uh, final conclusion of primary PCI in these patients with uh, understanding that um, testing is important, um, collaboration with our frontline workers in the emergency department to help uh, uh, referee equivocal cases is critical, and the understanding that using uh, adequate PPE is a reasonable approach uh, to protecting the staff and the lab uh, while taking excellent care of these patients when they arrive in the hospital. Um, so COVID-19 uh, has many cardiovascular manifestations, as I described, be it from acute coronary syndrome to uh, non-thrombotic uh, uh, myocardial injury to arrhythmias to uh, pericardial effusions. Um, we know that the finding of myocardial injury is associated with worse COVID-19 outcomes. Uh, we also know that COVID-19 therapies or proposed therapies are not benign and may inflict damage. It's really important that we recognize those patients at risk for injury from some of these medications and to be careful about their use. Um, and I think the critical thing here is to be prepared. Um, hospitals like uh, Bahrain Specialist Hospital uh, need to continue to offer and expand cardiovascular care uh, to their patients and communities. And, and this doesn't happen in a vacuum. It is critical that these systems be prepared um, and uh, be ready uh, to deliver this care uh, uh, to, to their patients. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Aziz, and uh, we'll go on from there. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for the excellent presentation. Wonderful and concise presentation, very beautifully done. Uh, some questions I would want to ask you before I go show a little statistics about uh, Bahrain Specialist Hospital. Uh, First question is, Dr. Amar, which patient would you take to the cath lab and which patient would you not? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think this, this has helped me a lot in, in figuring that out. And we had a lot of debate in our own group about how to manage these patients. I think uh, a few things to keep in mind. The clinical history remains very important. A patient with sudden onset chest pain, with ST elevations, without fever or cough, uh, 
is a STEMI, and that patient should go to the lab. Now, should you uh, be cavalier and avoid PPE? No, the disease is highly prevalent. The lab, the ER, and the lab staff uh, need to uh, adopt uh, the personal protective equipment and assume that everybody is positive until the patient rules out. Um, on the other hand, uh, the patient with fever and cough uh, may well have an acute coronary syndrome that needs to be managed in the cath lab. And again, that underlies the importance of uh, protective measures. There are gonna be equivocal patients, not too different than the patient that we saw in the presentation who had uh, ST elevations, but did not appear to be ischemic ST elevations. And in that case, uh, using a bedside echocardiogram, potentially a rapid CT coronary angiogram could help avoid taking the patient to the cath lab um, uh, and, and, uh, and exposing uh, the staff. Uh, yeah, thank you. In fact, uh, I was going through a case series from the New York City where the, it was a small case series by Sripal Bangalore, about 18 patients where they suspected an acute MI. Out of which only eight turned out to actually have an MI and the 10 did not have an MI. And out of uh, this, they took them for cath and six of them had obstructive coronary disease and uh, the rest did not. So actually, I think it becomes more important to go for the invasive procedure so you actually know what you're de dealing with. And uh, this brings me to the question, what would you say is the role of thrombolysis in managing acute MI in the present scenario? Yeah, I, 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 this is another thing that we struggled with and we thought about very carefully. So uh, what are the advantages of thrombolytics, right? So the advantage of thrombolytics is that you uh, avoid the need to go to the lab acutely at night, but it does not obviate the need uh, to get an angiogram. So in the current era, a pharmacoinvasive strategy would involve going to the lab at some point. Um, moreover, the patient that's treated with lytics is going to require intensive ICU care, right? So these are patients that are going to need Q hourly neuro checks um, that may not have um, uh, adequate treatment of their MI um, and may end up going to the lab on thrombolytic therapy with the attendant risk of increased bleeding. So from our perspective, where we have an established primary PCI program, we elected to avoid a lytic-based strategy and go directly to the lab, uh, understanding that um, these patients may have a shorter hospital stay if they receive uh, a primary PCI and that their intensive care needs are gonna be markedly reduced if they receive primary PCI and their time to discharge may be remarkably lower with primary PCI. So we've, we've stuck with our strategy of primary PCI and uh, have decided not to use lytics uh, in these patients. Uh, I agree with you on this. Uh, fibronolysis uh, does uh, extend the stay because you're going to lyse him today and take him to the cat tomorrow. So you're going to extend the stay and you said, like you said, neurological recovery needs to be monitored. And what also has been found is half of these patients do not actually have obstructive CAD. And by, li by lysing them, you're producing more harm. Absolutely. It's all risk and no reward. And the other thing that happens is most of these patients are presenting late. So by that time, the clot is already organized and more fibrotic and more resistant to lysis than uh, a primary PCI. This uh, brings me to the next question. Uh, what is uh, about uh, anticoagulation, the role of, of anticoagulation? Because we've seen, uh, like you mentioned, there are a lot of thromboembolic events, a lot of thrombotic events, but also there, is, uh, there have been reports of DIC in these patients. So how do you consider the, the anticoagulations here? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And again, something where we're dealing with in a, in a, in a data-free period, there was a really nice review from uh, Jack uh, just a couple of uh, days ago, reviewing a strategy for the use of anticoagulants in these patients. And they highlighted uh, what you mentioned, the, use, the, 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 imp, the prevalence of uh, DIC in these patients. And, and the bottom line is that um, we should continue the use of prophylactic anticoagulation as per our standard policy uh, for the management of inpatients, that there is probably a subset of patients who benefit from uh, uh, systemic anticoagulation rather than just prophylactic dosing. And that may need to be guided by uh, D-dimer or uh, surveillance uh, ultrasonography of the deep veins uh, uh, at an in, in an intermittent fashion. Again, um, no prospective data in this space. Uh, we, we just don't know uh, the right answer here. All right, there's a question from Dr. Khalid Bintani. He's a practicing cardiologist at Salmania. Uh, 
So he is asking about any data regarding antiplatelet therapy efficacy like ticagrelor, prasugrel, clopidogrel, and anti-COVID-19 medications. Yeah, a great, great question. Um, and uh, this is something that was covered briefly in that Jack article, and I can uh, put up a link of it uh, here in just a minute. Uh, the, the, the utility of these drugs, again, yet to be seen. We, we don't know the answer to this question. Um, we do know that, like uh, Dr. Aziz mentioned, that there is a subset of these patients who develop severe thrombocoagulopathy, uh, and some of them develop frank thrombocytopenia. Um, so that may uh, 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 point us in the direction of avoiding uh, uh, aggressive antiplatelet therapies, um, but we, we don't know. And with regards to antiviral therapies, um, the remdesivir uh, data um, that, that's available uh, was non-randomized and, uh, um, uh, and used uh, in a compassionate use basis. So we, we don't really know the impact of this drug, but we remain hopeful. And uh, from what we can tell here on the ground is that we should have randomized trial data, uh, hopefully in the next two to four weeks. Uh, there's a question from the audience. Dr. Riptehaj is asking, consider, uh, is it true that the pathophysiology of COVID-19 affecting the heart is through the AC and A receptors? Yeah, that, that's a great question. In fact, I'm part of a research group here that's putting together a proposal to do uh, ACE, uh, ACE po uh, polymorphism testing and uh, in patients who uh, present for COVID-19 and to do uh, a cohort study to figure out whether the ACE polymorphism uh, is associated with worsening clinical outcomes. So this is a really hot topic and has really been looked at in both ways. So, you know, people have proposed that the use of ACE inhibitors or a angiotensin receptor blockers is associated with the upregulation of the ACE2 receptors and may be associated with worsening uh, of COVID symptoms. Um, uh, uh, and the opposite has also been uh, proposed, that the increased uh, presence of these receptors may blot out uh, the viral response. So we really don't know. There was a uh, paper that came out of uh, China just again a couple of days ago. Um, this was a retrospective uh, 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 study that looked at outcomes of patients who received ACE or ARB um, and uh, looked at their association with outcomes. And uh, the study showed that ACE or ARB was not associated, ACE or ARB use was not associated with worse outcomes. Um, I would just caution the interpretation of that study. Uh, you can imagine that if a patient is well enough to receive an ACE or ARB, that means that their blood pressure is high enough to tolerate that drug, which inherently means that they probably have better survival. The fact that somebody is pulled off of an ACE or ARB probably indicates um, that their blood pressure was not in good shape and they were going to have uh, problems in the future. So again, without prospective randomized data, it's really hard to interpret uh, a lot of what's coming out these days. So the, and there were a lot of questions about uh, continuing use of ACE or ARBs in patients who are mildly symptomatic. And a lot of the uh, societies, including the European Society of Hypertension, the American societies, they have come up uh, with guidelines uh, and said, do not stop the ACE or ARBs if the patient is tolerating them. And uh, do not initiate if they're not on them. So the, I think uh, the question is still out there and we need more studies on this. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think if a patient has a hard indication for ACE or ARB and isn't on them, so if they have uh, a heart failure with reduced LV systolic function, they should not be pulled off their drugs. You run the very real risk of triggering heart failure exacerbation in these patients. And uh, as I told you earlier, patients with underlying heart disease are the very highest risk for COVID related complications. So our goal in our practice has been to work very aggressively in keeping our heart failure patients out of the hospital as much as possible. One question from Dr. Mohammad Rashid. Dr. Rashid, please go ahead and ask your question. Looks like he's muted. Dr. Rashid, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Maybe the moderator can unmute him. So until he can do that, uh, one question I wanted to ask is uh, regarding the pathophysiology of acute MI, is there a role of arteritis or vasculitis? Because uh, there's actually an inflammation, there's a cytokine storm. Is it possible that it is vasculitis or arteritis that is causing these MIs? Uh, 
So, so you've hit a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. As you know, my wife is a rheumatologist, and uh, we we uh, we have a very uh, we have a lot of conversations about this because to talk about it in our house, I guess. Um, and uh, and uh, yes, we we think that there may be uh, a direct myocardial injury related to this process that is independent of uh, plaque rupture and thrombosis. Um, in the very limited pathological studies that we've seen, though. Um, it appears that the inflammatory cells in the macrophages are in fact highly infected in, uh, in myocardial tissue. But interestingly enough, the, the myocardial cells themselves um, uh, don't appear to have a high viral burden. So it may well be that the inflammatory cells working on the microvasculature is the source of a lot of this injury, uh, be it due to uh, frank vessel inflammation or due to microthrombi uh, related to the inflammatory uh, condition. Travis, there's one more question about cardiac arrhythmias in our COVID-19 patients. What type of arrhythmias do we see initially and what is the percentage of patients having these arrhythmias? Yeah, so a study from uh, Italy was very helpful in, in showing that 20% that, uh, of patients admitted. Uh, so remember, uh, thankfully, a majority of COVID-19 patients are not admitted to the hospital, but in those patients that make it in uh, will experience some arrhythmia. In the uh, ICU, it's almost half of them with 6% of the total developing ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, some of the most more common arrhythmias are supraventricular, um, uh, be it atrial fibrillation uh, uh, or, uh, or the unmasking of underlying AVNRT due to the uh, increased catecholo uh, catecholamine state. Um, all of which can be treacherous in managing these patients uh, and uh, need to be uh, managed carefully. Okay. Uh, how often do you see these arrhythmias being triggered by hydroxychloroquine? That's a harder question to answer. I mean, we've definitely seen our fair share of QT prolongation um, in these patients. Uh, the uh, critical care group here um, early in the course based on the earlier data was uh, almost uniformly using this combination of drugs and we were seeing a fair amount of QT prolongation and needing to stop these medications uh, in those patients. Um, the, uh, the end stage implication of QT prolongation, be it uh, torsades um, or otherwise, um, thankfully we've not seen commonly, but um, I would just say that in a drug that has no established benefit, um, it's concerning even to see a little bit of it. Exactly. I was uh, reading a publication from the uh, Veteran Affairs Hospital yesterday, the, this morning, where they have they've compared uh, three groups. One was hydroxychloroquine, the other was hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, and the third one was no hydroxychloroquine. And they actually found higher mortality with hydroxychloroquine and lower mortality in those patients who are not taking any hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, I saw that paper too. And again, you know, this is one of those things uh, about, about science in the COVID moment that I, I think a lot of uh, uh, data scientists are going to write about in the coming years. You know, this is, uh, an, this is a non-randomized group of patients. So you, you can understand that there's a lot of bias in who's getting hydroxychloroquine. You know, pulling the trigger to add this drug probably means that the patient was sicker at baseline. Um, the decision not to use this drug uh, may have been, pull, you know, uh, made by the fact that the patient looked pretty okay and probably would have survived one way or the other. So again, I think, you know, the we need to stay tuned. We need to look at this data carefully and uh, interpret it with caution. Well, question from Dr. Najah Zayani. What, pro what precautions do you take in the cath lab in order to not uh, cross-contaminate other patients and the staff? And do you routinely test all patients before taking to the cath lab? And do you do routine testing of the cath lab team? Yeah, that's a great question and something, again, that we're, we're uh, uh, is an evolution here. So early in the disease course and until this day, we decided that anybody coming to the lab emergently uh, would be treated as a COVID positive or at least a, per, a patient under investigation, which meant that patients were masked uh, 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 in the emergency department um, before coming up to the lab. Our entire staff was decked in full PPE. So again, that is um, hair covering, face shield, N95 respirator, mask, gown, um, and shoe coverings. Um, uh, we have a careful process of having somebody observe us, wear our PPE to make sure that we're not leaving any gaps. 
and we have a careful process of taking off our PPE where uh, we monitor each other uh, taking off our equipment to make sure that uh, we don't contaminate ourselves as we uh, take things off and dispose of the protective equipment. Uh, following departure of the patient from the lab, the uh, room goes into a terminal clean and uh, the, uh, the uh, and is, and, uh, and uh, again with, uh, with staff that are in protective equipment. Uh, you seem to be muted, doctor. Yeah, so regarding uh, cath lab uh, emergencies during the COVID-19 pandemic, I would like to give a very brief presentation. So, yeah. So brief history of COVID-19 in Bahrain, it was on 21st February that the first case was confirmed about, this was a bus driver who came from Iran via Dubai. And by the end of the month, there were about 38 cases. 16th March, the first death was reported. Until date, there have been total seven related deaths and more than 700 recoveries. And uh, this chart was uh, is very important. This is the COVID-19 cases in the Gulf uh, countries since, the, since March 2020. If you can see this blue line here is Bahrain uh, line. So it shows the curve is still flat. One might argue that the population of Bahrain is not much, but then if you look at this graph, this is of yesterday uh, from the ministry, uh, Total number of active cases about 1,182, and discharge is 784, with the uh, death rate of about seven in these patients. But it works out to 0.3 percent death rate, which is fantastic, I think. So, how? Uh, what are the measures that the Bahrain government is taking to limit COVID-19? The ministry has been issuing guidelines from time to time uh, to the public, to the hospitals, to other public places. They have set up exclusive centers for treatment, extensive testing, tracing, and testing. This is the strategy they have adopted, and it's working wonderfully so far. And they've suspended all public gatherings. They've suspended all schools and universities. They've launched an app that uh, gives you the location of uh, active cases. So you, uh, if you're close to them, if you've come in contact with them, you can get yourself tested. Now, how is a BSH hospital uh, limiting the measure of COVID-19. So the, some of the measures which are extensively used is a single point of entry for all patients, mandatory thermal screening and a self-reported questionnaire for history of symptoms, history of travel or contact with suspected or confirmed cases. And all patients are given a face mask, sanitizer and explained about the use. Sanitizers are installed at various places within the hospital. Social distancing is practiced at the reception, the waiting area inside the clinics and restricted the number of visitors and visiting hours. When it comes to the cardiac clinic, we are more uh, cautious. We want our st uh, staff to stay uh, away from COVID-19. We want our patients to stay away from COVID-19. So there's a separate dedicated floor, floor for the cardiac clinic and social distancing is maintained at the reception, the waiting area and inside the clinics. Appointments are spaced out to prevent crowding in the waiting area. Any suspected infectious patient is first screened in the isolation room of the ER. And we're encouraging online or video consultation, especially for PP patients who are asymptomatic or follow-up patients. And the medication is dispensed directly to the patient's home or at the pharmacy without and avoiding crowding at the clinics. For the cath lab and the CCU, the CCUs are well spaced out, individual units separate from each other, and there is no mingling of patients. And there, is, there are dedicated staff for each patient. There is a separate, well uh, demarcated isolation room for any suspected patients. The cath lab staff is restricted to the cath lab. The CCU staff is restricted to the CCU. So there is no intermingling between the staff and there's no cross-contamination. And we use adequate PPE for all staff and now for all procedures. And after every procedure, there's a terminal cleaning and dis disinfection. And we fast track admissions and discharge so that patients spend lesser time in the hospital and lesser chance of exposure to the virus. A, a small uh, pie diagram showing what we have done since the beginning of the epidemic. So February 21st was the first case. Since then, we've done about 28 cases in the cath lab so far. As you can see, most of them have been acute MI related. Rescue PCI in about 7%, 14% having post lysis acute STEMI syndromes, 18% with a non ST elevation MI, 32% with unstable angina, 3% post CA VG patients, one patient who had a resuscitated cardiac arrest, and very few, very few stable patients. So more and more emergencies and uh, less and less stable patients. And this is some of the patients that we have done. This was an acute antiviral MI who was kept in a different hospital for the last two days on heparin, morphine, continued to have chest pain, was brought here. She was a very, very critical block in the LAD. 
put in a stand and a fantastic result goes home in two days. This was a Bahraini gentleman with a non-ST elevation MI, chest pain since about 24 hours. And he presented to us with a deep T inversions in the precordial leads. This was a critical lesion in the LAD. And after the standing, the result was what? fantastic. Patient discharged the next day. This was an acute inferior MI who was thrombolized, but kept on having post-infarction angina. And he came to us of, after almost 15 days and we did angiography, found focal triple vessel disease with a low syntax score. We went ahead and did the stenting to his LAD, to the left circumflex and to the right coronary artery and the patient was discharged after two days and is doing uh, well. So most of these patients, the common things that I've observed is like you said, they are delaying coming to the hospital for fear of contracting the virus. And the delay is in the mindset of the patients themselves, also probably in, in the referring doctors. The referring doctors also, somehow there is a conception that, you know, doing a procedure in this pandemic is uh, risky. But what I would say is not doing a procedure in a patient who has an unstable uh, syndrome is much more riskier. So all of our patients underwent uh, procedures successfully with prompt relief of the symptoms. The average length of stay was one and a half days. We tried to keep it as low as possible. And patients were kept in isolated cabins in the CCU to prevent any unwanted exposures. And we've done follow-up by our online consultations. Rarely outpatient visits were required, no infections reported so far. So the take-home message from my point of view is non-COVID-19 related emergencies are going to affect the population, MIs, uh, unstable angina, acute coronary syndromes, and these need to be addressed and with appropriate precautions these patients can be successfully treated without increasing the risk of exposure to the patient or the staff. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Naja. Uh, uh, Madam is asking, do you have a video that you can share regarding the PPE that you're using? Uh, I don't have a video. Let's see if I can find a picture in my in, uh, kit here. Give me just a second and uh, we'll share this picture here. Um, there's a great, there's a bunch of resources uh, available to, let's see, share screen. There you go. You look very handsome in that suit. You know, I think I look better with a mask on. <laughs> Anyway, Dr. Ahmed, there's a question from Dr. Bashar. He's thanking you very much for the informative presentation and he wants to know about the micro and macro circulatory thrombosis and consequent cardiac ischemia. Is that an atypical RDS? Is this why we are losing some patients very rapidly? And this yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. I think, you know, as, as I showed from that pathology paper from New Orleans, um, the patient had diffuse microthrombotic injury in the distal uh, pulmonary bed. Um, and and uh, I, uh, let me go back to that picture, actually, just to show you the, uh, what happened to the right ventricle in that case. I mean, the right ventricle was completely blown out. And I think what happens is these patients develop, um, uh, you know, uh, a pulmonary hypertension state that's triggered by, both by the hypoxemia and by the obstruction of the, of the uh, pulmonary arteries. Um, and uh, once this happens, uh, it, it's, it's essentially game over. And you know, I, I'll tell you, I had the most humbling case. One of the things that we do as interventional cardiologists during this crisis is uh, we support the ICU by putting in invasive lines uh, for the ICU teams. Uh, so one night I was called in, I did seven cases and you know, some of them were very sick and elderly, and I felt, well, I'm not sure these patients are going to survive, but one was a very young woman um, whose only risk factor was obesity, and I put in her line and her A-line, and she was great on a relatively low dose of oxygen and was doing okay. I checked up on the patients uh, the next morning, and all of them had survived except this young woman who acutely, when you read the chart, was doing fine, fine, fine until... Uh, about an hour before her demise, her FiO2 demand went up dramatically, her blood pressure tanked, and no matter what they did, they could not get her back. And, and I think what's happening in these patients is that they're having uh, a, a severe thrombotic uh, event, and, uh, and it's, it's resulting in this injury. Uh, I think the, the, the hope is that we can predict who has these events and we can present, potentially prevent them uh, with the use of antithrombotic and potentially anti-inflammatory agents.
Okay, that's great. Question from Dr. Rashid. Dr. Rashid, are you there? Still muted. Dr. Rashid, you would have you would have to unmute, unmute yourself, or if you cannot do that, just please text in your question, and we will uh, raise the question for you. Dr. Amar, what uh, what about uh, yeah, there's one question from uh, Dr. Shailendra Motwani is asking about the utility of ECMO in COVID-19. Yeah, great, fantastic question. And you know, uh, ECMO for those, uh, for those of us who don't use it frequently is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. That's a process by which uh, blood is taken out of a vein, uh, put through an oxygenator machine and uh, either put back through the venous system. So that's veno-venous ECMO or in the case of uh, cardiac uh, compromise, so where the cardiac output is compromised, um, it's uh, sent through the arterial circulation. Um, as you can imagine, this is a highly technically demanding uh, supportive care um, and requires extraordinary IC ICU resources. It is uh, certainly not available uh, widely, even in the United States. Um, and uh, is again the subject of registry studies. So there is a, a, an ECMO registry for COVID-19 um, uh, and there have been some success stories anecdotally where after several days of ECMO support, patients are uh, liberated from the uh, ECMO support and eventually from the ventilator and subsequently discharged to home. Um, for every one of those expo, uh, ECMO successes, there are a lot of ECMO failures and it's no fault of the technology. It's just the fact that these patients are very, very sick um, and the outcomes are unfortunately very poor once they get to that point. Yes, anyway, ECMO seems to be effective even in other sepsis situations when you start down ECMO really early in the process. And you know, once the process is delayed, the third day or fourth day, ECMO seems to be worthless. This is my personal experience. What do you say? Yeah, I, I think that if, if, it's, if it's deployed too late in extremis, like many therapies, it's not going to be as effective. And you really want to deploy ECMO in um, a candidate who has a higher chance of survival. So that's one. You need to have good case selection. Uh, it needs to be done in a center that is used to using ECMO in the ICU for prolonged periods of time because that's what these patients need uh, in order for them to have the adequate lung recovery uh, to support decannulation. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's a very narrow band of patients and hospital centers that are able to uh, accommodate these patients. Yes. Uh, one question is, uh, what is the role of BNP and D-dimers in uh, treating a COVID-19 patients? Yeah, so one of the things that we did early in our uh, process here at the University of Illinois is to define parameters that we're going to track on all patients. And the hope is by collecting this data set, we will prospectively have information on how these uh, biomarkers correlate with disease progression and potentially uh, what their opportunity is for predicting uh, decompensation and potential opportunities uh, for intervention. Um, there is definitely a, a school of thought that in patients who have a, remarked, a remarkable um, uh, elevation in D-dimer that they be upgraded from prophylactic anticoagulation to therapeutic anticoagulation in the hope of uh, preventing a catastrophic VTE event. Um, again, yet to be seen how efficacious that is. Um, uh, I, I would suggest that probably the downside of that hopefully is not, not too high and maybe something uh, uh, reasonable to do. All right, Dr. Ahmed. Yes, so the, uh, I would like to know the participants that the video will be shared online and it will be available even after the session is over. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Ahmed very much. It was a very, very uh, good presentation, very clear, very crisp, so many questions answered. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I, uh, Ramadan Karim to everybody and uh, looking forward to meeting with you in person soon. Inshallah. We end this meeting. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much.